It's helpful to think of different philosophies as different kinds of tools. For example, mathematical philosophy, like mathematical Platonism, can be thought of as a microscope, useful for understanding the fundamental nature of the material world, but not very useful in your day-to-day -day life. On the other hand, a philosophy like American pragmatism can be thought of as a handsaw, a great tool for cutting through abstract philosophical questions about the nature of reality by asking if such questions can even provide us with practical utility in the first place. And then you have something like postmodernism, which I think is best thought of as a bucket of paint. All you have to do is walk up to a culturally significant piece of art or literature, dump the paint on it, ruin it, and then claim you've done something revolutionary and insightful. Stoicism, I think, is best thought of in this framework as a jackknife, in that it is a simple but extremely useful philosophy. If you were stranded out in the wilderness trying to survive and you could only have one tool, the jackknife would be the one you want. At least, that's what I think Bear Grylls would say. And in the same line of thought, if you were someone who was facing a prolonged set of extremely difficult and dangerous circumstances, Stoicism might be the best philosophy you could adopt, but don't take my word for it. Here is Dr. Michael Sugru of Princeton University. Stoicism is an appropriate philosophy, I would say, for serious, ruthless, introspective people that want real answers and are willing to take no nonsense. In that respect, it's, an, it's a kind of uh, moral philosophy I would be inclined to teach at, say, West Point. If I were teaching people that are going to be under terrible danger and terrible, fearful conditions, I would teach them to do what they know they ought to do and to discipline and organize their emotions in such a way as they behave themselves in a way that is not disgraceful. It's an excellent philosophy for military men. It's an excellent philosophy for people that are going to be practical politicians if they intend to be virtuous, if they intend to pursue the public good. And while this will largely be a critique of Stoic philosophy, the reason I'm making this video is because it's very easy for me to get lost in the abstract world of philosophy, cognitive science, neuroscience, and just the general collapse of civilization. And I recently reread Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, and I found myself re-inspired to focus on the more routine aspects of my life, the things that I can actually control. I found new energy to focus on eating healthier and exercising and getting to bed on time and, more importantly, waking up on time. And I find myself listening to more podcasts and lectures about personal health so I can get my own life in order as a 25 year old who knows very little of the world in order to justify making videos about all the abstract stuff that I do. Here is a good summary of the central tenets of stoicism that I have found to be most useful. You can't control the weather, you can't control other people, you can't control the society around you. There's only one thing and one thing only that you are in control of and that is you. Your will, your intentions, yourself. In other words, the wise man, the truly philosophical man, is the man who is entirely in control of his own soul, who takes utter and complete moral responsibility for his actions and is indifferent to everything else, not because he doesn't care about other people, not because he doesn't care about the felicity of the entire human species, but because it's not under his control. There's no use wondering or worrying about what tomorrow will bring since tomorrow isn't under your control. Do what's right today and let tomorrow take care of itself. So with this in mind, let me explain the two primary criticisms I have of Stoic philosophy. The first is that it makes suspect assumptions about rationality, and the second is that it encourages unproductive detachment from the world. Let's start with the first criticism. One of the central themes that runs through Stoicism is that to be rational is to be good, and to be good is to be rational. This idea is illustrated well in Book 4 of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. If thought is something we share, then so is reason what makes us reasoning beings. If so, then the reason that tells us what to do and what not to do is also shared. The logic continues to say, if so, we share a common law and thus are fellow citizens and are fellow citizens of something, and that something is the world. But the problem here is the same problem that modern rationalists face, which is that rationality as a cognitive process may be near universal in humans, but each individual is operating on their own set of facts and experiences on which the faculty of rational thinking draws upon. Take the following example. If you grew up as a victim of brutalizing and horrific oppression, as someone like Malcolm X did, your capacity for rationality might justifiably lead you to an active and aggressive resistance against your oppressors. After all, it is what the Founding Fathers did against the British, and we generally laud that in American society. On the other hand, if you grew up in a relatively more stable family environment and studied the nonviolent tactics of Gandhi and Tolstoy, it would appear rationally self-evident that adopting those same tactics would be your best bet for addressing societal oppression. To say that either Malcolm X or Martin Luther King was more or less rational than the other seems wrong to me. Rather, we have to acknowledge that rationality is not the fundamental determining factor when it comes to what is good or not. And it certainly is not enough to simply draw a logical chain from the fact that we have a shared rationality to we therefore will agree on a common set of laws and moral prescriptions. 
Now, there are some additional mistakes that Stoic philosophy makes when it comes to rationality. For example, Aurelius writes that to care for all human beings is part of being human. This to me seems self-evidently wrong. Given humans' tribal nature, it is perfectly rational, although deeply immoral, because those two are not the same things, for one population of individuals to oppress and seize the resources of another population if it benefits them. There is no shortage of historical or evolutionary psychological evidence for this idea. Let's say that the impulse to genocide is something that lurks inside human beings, awaiting certain indicators that it is the moment for that program to be triggered. Were that the case, you would want people to engage that question ahead of time when they were in possession of their full faculties and to recognize that they might have a program within them that violates the values that they believe are their their guide. And most confusingly for me, Marcus Aurelius writes, no one does the wrong thing deliberately. Again, this is part of the idea that to be rational is to be good, and so those who are doing wrong things are to be pitied rather than held in contempt. But as people like Jordan Peterson point out, it is a fatal mistake to misattribute irrationality or ignorance to people who have deeply malevolent intentions. They encounter someone who's out there in the world who's actually operating to hurt them. And so, and if the person is psychopathic enough, and this is actually goes beyond pure psychopathy, because at least the psychopath has the sense to be self-interested. You can go far farther than that, where you're perfectly willing to hurt yourself as long as you hurt the other person at the same time. And that's where you go when you're doing something like conjuring up the idea that you might shoot up a school. Because those people always kill themselves at the end. And you might think, well, why don't they just save everyone a lot of trouble and kill themselves at the beginning? Well, that wouldn't exactly be the point, would it? They, what they want to say is, life means nothing to me. Nothing. But, I'm perfectly willing to make as many people as I possibly can suffer before I demonstrate that. The second major critique I have of Stoicism is the general theme of detachment from the world in regards to both personal and social ills. Listen to the following excerpt from Dr. Michael Sugru's lecture. A wise man, a man who is disciplined in control of his motions, and follows the way of nature, can be a good man no matter what his position in a social structure is. He is not responsible for the social structure and it is not his problem. If the gods or nature or whatever is controlling the world makes you a slave, then be a good slave. If God or nature or whatever is controlling the world makes you an emperor, then be a good one. Your job is not to disgrace yourself and live up to the highest potentials of human being. Now, in principle, this injunction has its merits. By focusing on your own life and tending to your own moral obligations, you put yourself in the best position to effect change on a large scale. This is certainly in line with the philosophy of notable figures that I hold in high regard. But the stoic insistence that you cannot control the social structure you operate in can be misleading, and everyone who lives in a democratic state should recognize this. Democracies are predicated on the belief that individuals do exert control over the direction of society, and the idea that one should only focus their beliefs inward undermines the work of people who dedicate their lives to rectifying corruption and injustices in the world around them. But the underlying theme of detachment isn't limited to the social world. Stoic philosophy takes a hyper-rational approach to individual and emotional life, summarized best, I think, in this passage here regarding death. Death is a natural thing, and nothing natural is evil. There is obviously some truth in this, but the Stoics seem to take this idea too far. For example, Aurelius says, If you are distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your estimate of it, and this you have the power to revoke at any moment. Perhaps there are people who are so low in their sensitivity to negative emotion that this may be true, but for most people, this idea doesn't seem to have much merit. People who suffer trauma are not capable of revoking their pain at any moment, and we know extreme trauma changes the very structure of the brain in such a way that prevents the cortex, the part of the brain responsible for rational thinking, from inhibiting the much more powerful emotional structures in the more ancient limbic systems of the brain. To take an extreme example of the problem with this, imagine someone's child is killed by a malevolent individual. A true stoic would acknowledge this as a natural part of life and seek to move on. After all, death is a natural thing, and nothing natural is evil, aside from allowing oneself to succumb to his or her own vices. But as people like Jordan Peterson point out, someone who has suffered PTSD as a result of witnessing terrible malevolence require a philosophy of good and evil, one that differentiates the two as something other than mere natural products of individual vice or reason. Post-traumatic stress disorder, that's a good example, or cases of serious abuse, child abuse, or like truly reprehensible interactions between people, they're best conceptualized with regards to a dialogue about the nature of good and evil. In, in fact, with post-traumatic stress disorder, 
that's actually necessary, I believe. Most people would develop PTSD and other, and other catastrophic psychological reactions when something terrible, not so much when something terrible happens to them, but when something terrible happens to them because of someone malevolent. So to treat someone in a situation like that, you have to help them develop a philosophy, I would say, but probably a theology of good and evil, because you have to investigate the structure of the motivation for malevolence. Now, despite these criticisms, I still maintain that Stoicism is a rich and practical philosophy. And if you're looking for reasons and motivation to reorient your life in a healthy way, as I tried to do, and did with some success, I highly encourage you to look into Marcus Aurelius's meditations and discover how much practical wisdom you can get from a book that's almost 2,000 years old. So, good luck, and Godspeed. Thank you.